it's lovely to have you all here. Um, it's lovely to have Mr. Porter here. And I'm going to go straight over to um, Mr. Porter to kick off this evening's talk. So uh, the final Max talk of the series. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Barnes. So were you lucky enough to have a first or second class ticket for the maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic from Southampton to New York? I say lucky enough. Didn't turn out to be that lucky. And you're out on the promenade deck on the 14th of April, 1912. This is probably what the sea would have looked like as you crossed the Atlantic and got closer towards Greenland and Newfoundland. Um, the pack ice had broken off from Newfoundland and was starting to drift further and further south into what was known as Iceberg Alley, where the Titanic was steaming at full speed, you know, upwards of 21 knots. Um, passengers reported seeing small elements of pack ice and the ice starting to get more and more apparent as they got closer and closer to their eventual demise when they hit an iceberg you know, late on the 14th of April. So a little disclaimer, which I think it's safe to make. Um, I am not a confessed Titanic expert. This is very much a labor of love. I've really, really enjoyed researching this as a topic to put this together and uncovering some passions I had probably about 30 years ago where I did see myself as a Titanic expert. And I was rather hoping a lot of that knowledge would back into my head as I did some research. Not as much of it did as I hoped, but what I hope to go through um, is something slightly more enjoyable than a third class ticket for the maiden voyage, which would have been a pretty long haul for the three or four days that they were in uh, third class steerage. But there are 113 slides to this presentation. They don't all have lots of words on and hopefully they'll go quite quickly. But I've got, I've got a bit of a story to tell. Um, I really wondered which angle to go with with the Titanic because it's, it's such an interesting topic and it evokes so many emotions in lots of different people. So I've taken a bit of a, a five-pronged attack and I'll talk you through that in a moment. So um, here we are. I thought there's the Titanic. Well, probably more accurately, it should be that way around. Um, so when I thought about uh, talking to some people about the Titanic, I knew I could develop a bit of a passion about it. I knew I could remember some stuff you know, that would get my juices flowing. But I thought, okay, do I just get everything I can find from Wikipedia, put it in a presentation and tell people the story of the Titanic from design, purchase, sailing, sinking? And I thought, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's quite the story. So I've split it up, I hope. I've split it up and it's in no order. I've split it up to the movie because I think lots of people's experience of the Titanic is the movie Titanic from 1997. There's Kate and Leo there, there's Jack and Rose. Um, but I think a lot of people are interested in the Titanic because of the ship itself, the incredible piece of engineering that the Titanic was and the period of engineering it represented. But then, of course, as a historian, and Mr. Barnes will have some empathy with me here, you know, the history, you know, where did the Titanic come from? Why, where does it fit, you know, in sort of the history of the early 1900s? Um, of course, another interesting slide is the sinking. You know, the mechanics of how it sank and the night it sank and, and some of the relationships there um, and, and, and you know the, the events that led to so many people dying and such a prestigious luxurious piece of technology you know sinking down to the bottom of the ocean and I thought there's something very interesting about the way it was discovered and the discovery of the Titanic and actually that picture there if you, if you can look in the top left hand corner you can see the date the 090285. That's actually the 2nd of September 1985. And that's a still of the very first contact made with the Titanic. That's actually the very first outline. People have been searching for Titanic, Titanic for years, uh, but Dr. Robert Ballard, and I'll talk about him in a minute, when him and his team, him and his French team, it was an American French um, original expedition in 1985, eventually found the debris field of the Titanic. That is the first image they found. It's actually of one of the boilers that split when the Titanic uh, sank in its entirety. So, and, and the other slant was the story. Um, just just the, the interesting nuances and stories that have come up over time, the sort of the myths and legends, you know, and the two that I'll, I'll talk about, you know, that are detailed on that picture, you know, the band. Did the band play on? And did Captain Smith go down with his ship? And they're both still taken from the movie. And then interspersed, um, I've got a few of these. 
so I've called them Titanic trivia time, which is quite exciting. There's like three or four of these. It's just interesting things I've discovered. And I, like, so the first one is this. Okay, this is a book of music, and this has been brought up from the seabed. It's one of about five and a half thousand things that have come up from the seabed from the Titanic. And it's one of the music books that the band, did they or didn't they play on, was given when they were signed up to play on the Maiden Voyage. And there are 352 songs in it. And the members of the band had to know each one by rote. They had to be prepared as a band to play any song that one of the first class passengers asked them to play out of the 352 in this playbook, which I just think maybe as a musician, that's something you do regularly, but I just think it's incredible. And I think just plays interesting to this story, this, I, this the sort of myth about the Titanic and the three classes and the first class. And I think it's one of the ideas that's come very much from the movie, you know, and seeing these classes interact. I think that's one of the reasons the Titanic as a story resonates with us so much. Okay, so my interest in this, where does it come from? Well, um, it actually comes from these. It comes from a big stack of old National Geographic magazines. Now, I don't know where these came from in my life, but I just have this conscious thought of being about eight, nine, ten, and there being a big pile of National Geographic magazines in my house that date back to the 1970s, actually a bit older than some of the ones on this um, slide here. And I found them absolutely fascinating. Um, I couldn't read half of them. They're a bit too complicated for me at that age. But the pictures in them were incredible. Some of the adverts in them were incredible. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the National Geographic, but it often has adverts in it for um, private jets and very expensive watches. And I just found all of that absolutely fascinating. And so I used to thumb through these. And one in particular got me really, really interested in the National Geographic idea. I did, I, when I was about seven years old, I actually wrote to the National Geographic um, to ask them what the smallest planet in the universe was. Um, I had a bet with a friend and uh, they wrote back and I had for a long time a signed reply from the National Geographic, which unfortunately I don't have anymore, but it's a pride of joy for me. Um, so this one, this particular copy, January 1979, I don't know, again, I don't know how I got it. I don't know why it appeared in my house, but this is the one that got me really reading the National Geographic. And if you have a look at the list of contexts on the right hand side, you'll note no mention of the Titanic whatsoever. But you'll see humpbacks, the gentle whales, their mysterious songs. That thing there kept me reading the National Geographic. And why? Because inside the National Geographic, inserted, stitched in, was this Songs of the Humpback Whale. And I know this seems like a diversion, but I just remember it so incredibly. It was a floppy piece of vinyl, like a piece of paper. But you could play it on a record player and it played songs of the humpback whale and finding that in a magazine was just incredible so that got me into the national geographic and then in 1985 and researching this it was absolutely incredible that i found these front covers and i remember having these i remember the first time i opened the december 1985 edition of the national geographic and that was the front cover how we found titanic by dr by robert ballard and then the follow up December 1986, when his, his first sort of tranche of expeditions came to an end, the sort of long first expedition with um, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and his submersible called Alvin, which I've got a picture of later. You know, and it was full of these incredible pictures and they just stuck with me. And I think that's where my interest you know, in the Titanic came from. That's why I chose to sort of research it a bit and share some of that with you today. Um, I've managed to find some of the pictures that were in those. I don't have these magazines anymore, which is a shame. Um, but found some of the pictures and I've dotted them in um, to this present, to this talk. And I hope you sort of get from them what I've got from them. Just in some sense, just a sense of awe and wonder about some of the, the pictures and the nuances and how they tie into the way the Titanic's been represented in the media um, over the past you know, 100 or so years. So, I think the, 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 the general question is why does the Titanic still fascinate me? And why does it still fascinate vast swathes of the population? Just type in Titanic into Google and see, it is a huge, huge set of data out there of people talking about it, photographing it, selling it, buying it, replicating it. So I did some research on this and 
there's sort of there have been three distinct waves of fascination with the Titanic. And the first one was obviously immediately after it sunk. It was a huge story. It was a huge deal. The Titanic was this marvel of the Ed Edwardian era. It was this incredible engineering masterpiece. It was bigger. It was faster. It was better. It was more luxurious. And then it disappeared. And I think the loss of life was so incredible. To this day, it's still the greatest loss of life for an ocean-going liner. Um, immediately resonated. And there were books written. There were plays written. There were movies written immediately in the aftermath. And the 19, you know, the 19 teens, you know, 19, 12, 13, 14, immediately afterwards, and then, of course, rolling into the First World War, it immediately gained a sort of mythic status alongside this lost generation of 1914 to 1918. Interestingly, the second wave of sort of fascination came in the 1950s at the height of the Cold War, when, you know, people were really uncertain about what, what was going to happen to the world and to life. And um, this was just, this as an event seemed to crystallise a lot of people's interest as a sort of closed book of an event. It was built, it crashed, it sank, the end. And people bought into that as a, a finite process when their world seemed so up for grabs. And it corresponded with the publication of a book called A Night to Remember by um, Walter Lord, which was a sort of real diary, minute by minute diary of the final night of the Titanic. Um, and of course, more recently, the third big wave of interest uh, came in 1997 with the movie Titanic um, and the discovery in 1987, um, 1985 and going on to 1997. And, and since then, there's been a pretty consistent visitation to the Titanic wreck site um, and investigations into it and, and, and the theories of how it sank and then what actually happened on that night has been fairly sort of mainstream, you know, alongside the movie, which has been released two or three times in widescreen, in 3D, and it has kept the Titanic as an idea pretty front of mind. Um, so I've often thought about this idea of why it fascinates us and, and what is it over and above those things. And I first thought, well, is it because it was this incredible piece of technology that didn't work? And I thought, well, does it, does it, is it right to think of the Titanic alongside the Betamax video recorder, which you can see there, or the Zoom? And I'd be really interested if anybody on this call knows what a Zoom is. So that, the Zoom is Microsoft's version of the iPod. It was fantastic. It was a brilliant piece of technology, but it didn't, it didn't work. Apple beat it. The, the, the Sony Betamax, you know, fantastic piece of technology that just died without a trace. Does the Titanic fit there? Is it a technological marvel of, full of innovation that just didn't transpire to work properly? And, and to an extent, yes, it had some really interesting technological developments with the way it had bulkheads built into it that made it very, very difficult to sink. And they were flawed. They weren't engineered well. And so it sank when it probably shouldn't have done. Um, so maybe it fits here. I'm not sure. And then I thought, does it, does it fit alongside something else? Because not just the, any, any innovation, but is it this incredible piece of engineering that went wrong? And I thought, well, does it fit alongside the, the, the Challenger space disaster of 1986, which you know, people, myself and Mr. Barnes' age, probably remember to the minute. I do. I can remember the story breaking on news round and John Craven telling me about it and me running and telling my parents. You know, is that how people felt on the morning of the 15th of April when they saw the, they saw the newspaper report, Titanic sunk, great loss of life? Did they feel the same way um, when I felt, when I saw the, the, the space shuttle Challenger um, you know, blowing up and um, killing the astronauts, including the teacher, Krista McAuliffe? You know, this was a technological marvel. It was reused. It was... You know the pride and joy of its nation to an extent. So does the Titanic? And I wasn't sure whether the Titanic quite, quite got in there, uh, or is it fascinating because it's from this time? And there's a picture of um, it's, it's slightly earlier than the Titanic. Obviously, there's Brunel there, but just the scale of the engineering. And, and I know that in 2021, the scale of some of the engineering feats dwarf shipbuilding of this nature. Um, go to Dubai. Go. To New York and see some of the buildings there, and they really do dwarf anything that was done, you know, at the turn of the nineteenth century. But you know, pictures like that and the scale of the human being alongside the piece of machinery that that creates—they've created 
I think just further makes us you know, inherently interested and fascinating of, of, of failures of this nature with Titanic. So the first little section I want to talk about is um, the history. Now, I don't, know, I don't know who's on the call, so if any of you are taught history by me or understand that I'm history, I'm not going to go into some chronological historical study. I just wanted to look at a few things that are contemporaneous to the Titanic, bits of engineering that are, uh, come from the same era. So we can sort of contextualize how interesting the Titanic was, how out of kilter it might have been to what everyone else experienced in terms of technology. Um, okay, so there's the Model T Ford. That's what cars looked like when the Titanic was built. And I think if you were to take an image of the Titanic alongside an image of the car of its contemporary time, the Titanic seems like a technological step forward. It seems to be so far out of kilter with what most people are enjoying in terms of engineering technology. And obviously the engineering behind the, the Model T Ford is incredible, groundbreaking, revolutionary. But I just thought it was, I felt that was an interesting contrast. So the vacuum light, the light bulb of that nature. So, so the vacuum light bulb, that was being publicly made more available in the 19th century. So alongside people building the Titanic, you know, 50,000 tons worth of seagoing vessel. You know, this is the other types of engineering that are going on. One that I think is really interesting <laughs> is the dishwasher. So electric dishwashers were, and I think this really puts it into some context that you know, maybe there were big technological leaps. Maybe the, maybe the Titanic is actually backward when we know domestically we're now having electric dishwashers. I don't know, however, if anyone's about to ask a question, whether the Titanic kitchen staff had access to electric dishwashers. I would suggest they didn't. And so, you know, these were the first things coming out in about 1912, 1913. Um, something maybe slightly more close to home to myself, Mr. Barnes, I reckon we both recognize this one. Um, the Saltash Bridge or the Tamar Bridge. Yeah, although built about 40, 50 years before the Titanic, this is the age of big stuff. This is the age of building big. This is the age of man bettering nature. This is steel. This is heavy industry. This is making big, impressive things. Things like this. Um, this, the Joseph Paxson's Crystal Palace, big, impressive, age of empire stuff. And this is the context which the Titanic comes out of. You know, it was built, the, intern, inter, the insides were built in the empire style. You know, this was, if you like, for many, the manifestation of British engineering and its bettering of other parts of the world. This boat was built to beat things. It was built to beat records. So my second little section is the ship itself. Now, if there are any maritime folk on the call, I am going to unashamedly interchange the words ship, boat, I might say yacht by accident. Um, apologies, I probably won't say dinghy to describe the Titanic, but I might interchange ship and yacht and boat, and I'm probably wrong in doing so. Um, the Titanic was built to be big. It was built to be impressive. And for those of you who don't know the story, and I, I, I admit I've sort of glossed over it a bit. Okay. This was a passenger liner designed for service from Britain to New York. It is the flagship. It's the blue ribboned crossing. This is pre-aeroplanes. This is the way to cross the Atlantic. It was designed to carry about 2,200, 2,300 passengers, three classes, first, second, and third. I've got some pictures of that later. You'd like to be in first, but you don't want to be in third. And at the time, it was the largest ship afloat. I've got a few comparisons coming up with ships that have been built since, but it was the largest ship afloat. It had technological advancements. It had separate bulkheads in it, which would hopefully make it not sink. It had a state-of-the-art radio um, telegraph transmitter in it from the Marconi company. And it carried some of the wealthiest people in the world on its maiden voyage. It was a big deal, both in terms of engineering and in terms of status and in terms of being the flagship of the White Star Line. It's, the, it's British Airways Concorde. It's Singapore Airways first class suite. It's the Orient Express on a boat. 
it's the floating risk. It is all of those things. And on its maiden voyage from Southampton to New York, it hit an iceberg and sank. Simple as that. And 1,500 people died, and they shouldn't have done. It didn't have enough lifeboats. The crew were poorly trained. And it is the story of man's technological marvel probably not paying attention to, to um, nature as much as it probably could. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. The first of my Titanic trivia time, little intermission. Um, that is the captain of the Titanic, Edward Smith. Um, he didn't have a good day on the 14th. And there are some conflicting reports about how he dealt with the unfolding tragedy, some very damning of him, some very praiseworthy of him. But my trivia is this. Um, Edward Smith was born in Hanley in Stoke-on-Trent. Now, I don't know if anybody knows the Midlands. I know the Midlands reasonably well. Stoke-on-Trent is 68 miles away from the sea. It is by two miles, almost the furthest away from the sea you can be in Britain. And I think that's quite interesting as a piece of trivia for someone that had his career with the White Star Line of the captain of huge ships and eventually was the captain at the time of this great tragedy. So um, if you don't believe me, there's a picture of Hanley in Stoke-on-Trent and there is a picture of no sea at all within 68 miles of him. Okay, so back to, back to the ship. Um, it was big. It was really, really big. But I want to put it in context. I think that's interesting. Have a look at this. Um, the Titanic is, third, is fourth from the top. It's just under 600 feet long. So it's big. But it's smaller than an aircraft carrier. And it's smaller than the class of um, cruise liners we'd see today. And significantly smaller than this beast. The Seawise Giant, as it was known when it was broken up. You'll notice from this picture here that it's actually called the Yara Viking. This is the biggest, the biggest ship that's ever been built. It is over half a million tons. It was so big it couldn't go through the English Channel because its displacement was so big. It couldn't go through the Panama Canal. It couldn't go through the Suez Canal. It's actually been broken up um, now on the, uh, the shores of Gujarat in India. But I just want to put that in context. Yep, the Titanic was big, but there are much bigger ships here. And just, I think it's very difficult for us to understand the scale of some of these things. I think those of us that live on the South Coast and have been to Weymouth and Bournemouth and seen some of the big Oasis-class um, cruise liners get a sense of it. There we are, there's the Titanic in purple. Uh, there's the Queen Mary, famous liner, person, car, bus, Airbus A318. If you've seen one of those at an airport, they look huge. Um, so the Titanic very much fits in the pantheon of really big things. And I think that's very much part of its fascination. You know, at the time it was big. But, you know, look, look how it looks alongside today's um, Oasis class cruise liners. And I think that's an interesting comparison. But then I found these, which I think are crazy. Um, bit of computer generated imagery to show how something that the world sees as a huge ship, the Titanic, even the word has come into the lexicon as meaning big, um, you know, modern technology, incredible. And I've got a couple more, um, couple more interesting contrasts here. So it was just shy of 300 meters long, um, had about three and a half thousand members of the crew. And this, you know, compared to the picture here with that large um, oasis of the seas behind it, which is 360 meters long, carried a passenger, eight and a half thousand passengers. It's basically about five times the size. But the Titanic for its day had every bit of the luxury of some of these um, cruise liners of today, but in very slightly different styles. Well, here's an interesting picture. So on the left there is the Titanic swimming pool, heated swimming pool in 1912. And on the right is the swimming pool in an Oasis class um, cruise liner. Um, of course, they're different. You know, they're from 100 years different. I just think it's an interesting contrast when we think of the, the time difference and the luxury that the first class passengers received for their tickets. And I've got to tell you a little bit about the tickets in a minute. Um, there is an Oasis class loft suite compared to a first class cabin. Um, okay, interesting thing about this. Um, if you wanted to go for 
um, a cruise on the Oasis of the Sea, so a Caribbean cruise Oasis of the Sea. Um, one of these suites would probably cost you about fourteen hundred dollars for about seven days. Fourteen hundred dollars for seven days, amongst all the other stuff you have to pay. In comparative terms, the first class suite on the Titanic. I'll just give you a chance. Think you can guess. <clears throat> Obviously, we can't interact, but I'll let you guess. Um, $83,000 comparatively. So $83,000 for the first class suite of the Titanic and $1,300 on the first class suite of the Oasis of the Sea. Now I know earnings very different, um, but it is staggering how exclusive first class on the Titanic was. Third class, so where Jack in the movie Titanic was, as opposed to where Rose was, looked like this on the right. And interestingly, I've put a comparison of a Brittany's Ferries inside berth on the left. So the Brittany Ferries inside berth, you might be in for a four or five hours on your trip over to France or Spain on a holiday. The third class cabin on the right is a week's crossing. So when I referenced right at the beginning of this, that I hope this wouldn't be as much of a long haul this evening as third class on the, uh, on the Titanic. That's what I was referring to. So I don't want to spend too much about engineering. I'm not an engineer. This is just a little diagram of um, sizes of White Star Line ships and the Olympic and the Titanic and the Britannic are on the right hand side. It was explicitly built to be bigger. Its marketing potential was that it was bigger. It was a huge piece of engineering. Uh, people talk about it being unsinkable. I'm going to tackle that a little bit later, I think. But the White Star Line went out of their way to make this bigger. The engineering behind it was almost irrelevant. It just had to be bigger. It had to be able to be supported by advertisements like this, where the Titanic is clearly bigger than the pyramids, than St. Paul's, than any building on the New York skyline. It was 45,000 tons of advertising. If you look at this advert for um, selling tickets, You'll note that the big descriptor of the boats is their size. Size mattered in 1912. Having the biggest mattered. The fact that it was an engineering monster mattered. It sold tickets to be part of this big thing going to New York, this massively developing city. And it's difficult to understand the scale of that until you see a picture like this. That is the rudder and the propellers of the Titanic. And I've got a photo later of what that looks like right now. So you can see right at the bottom, one of the engineers. But it had all the mod cons. As a ship, it had all the mod cons. Uh, there's the gym. I'm going to use that picture again later. That's a picture, of, uh, a real picture of the gym. Um, it was designed to look like the Ritz. There's the grand staircase. It was a really extraordinary piece of work. But hold fire, Titanic trivia time, Titanic trivia time. Uh, this is bathtub related Titanic trivia. Um, for the entire third class population on the Titanic, of which there were 706 people, there were three baths. So three bathtubs for 706 people. There we are. <laughs> That's incredible. So back to the ship. Yeah, I've shown a picture of a pool, but there's the pool. But not only does it have a pool, it had this incredible ornate Turkish bath that was, obviously there are no uh, color pictures of this, but it was extraordinarily tiled and mosaic to look like you know, something you'd find in Istanbul. But one interesting thing that the, um, the Titanic did have on it was one of these. You might notice it from, um, it's the same car that's in the movie Titanic where Jack and Rose steam up the windows. But this is what cars looked like in 1912. The 1912 Renault Coupe de Ville, 2.64 litres, 25 horsepower, which shows that the engineering wasn't quite up to speed. Um, but I wanted to show all of that, about the grandeur of the ship, you know, the splendour of the Turkish baths, um, because this is what the people who built it lived like. These are photos from 1912 in Belfast. The Titanic was built in Belfast at the Harland and Wolf shipyard. And this is Belfast in 1912. And those 706 third class passengers 
might have come from here. They might have been people that helped build it and they would have lived here. It's a far cry from the first class passengers. And their destination, New York, this is what life was like in New York in, um, in 1912, uh, the tenements of New York. So large scale immigration and many of the third class passengers would have been looking to emigrate to the United States. I just think that's a really interesting contrast. If we're having a little section about the ship, that's an interesting contrast with what life was like when people were on the ship. Okay, but what was also on the ship are some things that we found since. You know, I mentioned earlier, five and a half thousand artifacts have been found from the floor of the Titanic, and they were on people, in people's suitcases, in their rooms on that maiden voyage. So this has been found. This is a platinum diamond ring that was found intact in a leather pouch on the floor of the ocean. That's a still from James Cameron's first visit to the Titanic in 2001, because he's been down a couple of times. So that comes up from the floor and that's where it was found. This is a felted rabbit fur hat. It was picked out of a suitcase on the floor of the ocean in the debris field of the Titanic. You remember I showed you a couple of slides ago, a picture of the, the propellers and the rudder. Well, that is them right now. That's the stern of the Titanic embedded into the seabed. You can just see those extraordinary propellers sticking out. Now it's about 2,000 feet away. The, 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 so we'll talk about the sinking in a minute, but the Titanic splits in half on its way down and the, the stern and the, the bow are very, very separate. <coughs> 35-year-old toolmaker, William Henry Allen. I mean, what a fantastic, interesting story he must have had. And these were found in his suitcase, his name suitcase, and he was a third-class passenger, and he didn't survive. Now, one of the things that's been quite interesting researching this is you see lots of people on the internet ask questions about bodies. Were there any bodies? Has anyone found any bodies? And no, there have been no remains found on the floor in the debris field of the Titanic, but there have been plenty of pairs of boots, some of which are ranged as if legs might have been in them. You can make your own judgments there. So, the sinking itself. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is a fantastic painting by a chap called Ken Marshall. And if you are interested in the Titanic, he has done some incredible um, paintings of it from, um, from eyewitness accounts, like this one here of the, of the sinking, and from visuals given to him by Robert Ballard, who discovered the Titanic, James Cameron. And a lot of his work is very interestingly replicated in some of the movies. So it's a gruesome thing, the sinking. It wasn't very nice. Um, so I won't spend too long on it. Um, I found a, a schematic about it, which sort of explains it. But I wasn't very happy with that because I'm not an engineer to talk through. But then I found a little two minutes narrated by James Cameron uh, on a National Geographic website about it sinking. And I just thought I'd play that, A, because it gives me a chance to put your breath and have a little drink. I think it's a very interesting, if anyone has any knowledge of the film, I'm sure most people have seen the film, you know, have a look at it, see if it matches what you think you remember from the film. Hope I can get it to work. I have tested this, but um, if it doesn't work, I won't give it too long to fire up. So I'll just crack on. In advance, I don't suppose anyone submitted any questions, have they? Uh, no, no questions at the moment. Um, just if I could remind everyone, please um, use the Q&A um, box if you'd like to. Um, please don't use the chat, um, use the Q&A, please. It's the easiest for us to access and answer questions. A couple of points, um, Matt, in the chat about uh, the um, number of lifeboats actually, actually exceeded um, the regulations of the time on the Titanic. Um, quite interesting. Now, as I said at the beginning, I'm not an expert, and so I can't refute some of that stuff immediately. But what I do know is that the number of lifeboats is a little bit irrelevant because what they didn't do is they didn't practice with them. 
they put that crew that were on the maiden voyage practice one lifeboat drill with no people before it embarks on its maiden voyage. So when the iceberg struck and they were, had to enact their lifeboat drill, uh, very fresh in my memory, because we've had a fire drill here this evening, we've got a pilot and we know exactly what to do. They didn't know what to do. And so all of the stories of um, you know, lifeboats being launched empty, lifeboats being um, launched over full, all of those are accurate from my understanding because they just didn't know how to deal with a crisis and weren't well trained, my understanding. Okay, so a little bit about the sinking. Sorry that video didn't work, but um, if anyone's interested, I can give you a link to it. So the ice conditions, from what I understand when the Titanic was crossing, weren't great, but they knew they weren't great. It was pretty common knowledge that at that time of year, there could be ice in those channels. And there was slightly more ice than they could have expected, but there were plenty of ships in the area and plenty of ships had told the Titanic that there was ice. They told them there were significantly large parts of ice. I mean, on the evening at about half, between half past seven and 20 to 10 at night, and, and the iceberg struck a bit later in the evening, the Titanic receives a number of very significant warnings about ice. However, reports are that those warnings never left the Titanic's radio room. They never got to the bridge. So when they entered what was known as Iceberg Alley, uh, where there was a large iceberg, which they eventually hit, they weren't expecting it, but they should have been. So when they saw um, the iceberg that they hit, they were doing the best part of 20 plus knots. And had they been aware of their greater levels of ice, they'd have been going slower. However, think of modern day airlines and the timetables they keep and the need for them to have quick turnarounds and meet their demands and meet their slots and fill their coffers. This is that. The Titanic had to be on time. It, its reputation was about getting to New York at the time it said it was going to New York. So it was going at its full pelt. And when you're going at full pelt and there's an iceberg in the way, you don't have a lot of options. So when it hit the iceberg, and there are differing stories on why it sank, obviously it hit an iceberg, which pierced the hull. There are stories about boilers exploding, um, which create bigger holes. But what is relatively um, sort of not up for debate is it had a hole in the hull and it began to take on extraordinary amounts of water. Seven tons of water a second is the estimate of what the Titanic was taking on. And this far, it had bilge pumps, it had pumping mechanisms, but it just far outstripped the boat's ability to, um, to get rid of the water. But for those passengers on it, reports are nobody really noticed. If you think about the movie, there's a scene where the, the iceberg looms up above the Titanic and there are people on the deck and the ice is scattered across the deck. Well, report, eyewitness reports are that probably wasn't the case. And passengers probably felt a bit of a rumble. It was described by someone, and I'll just read it out as, just as though we went over a thousand marbles. How this person knew what it was like to go over a thousand marbles, I don't know. Um, but eyewitnesses, crew members likened it to, you know, maybe shedding a, shedding a propeller, which I imagine is a big deal, but probably not uncommon if you're a seafaring boat. So, but there are others that report a big crash, a grinding noise. Um, but the facts are, it, it took a couple of hours to sink. And most of the passengers died. And I think that really plays to the fascination a lot of people have with this, in that this is a piece of technology that nature has wounded. And one of the reasons a lot of people died is that a lot of people on it weren't willing to accept that. They weren't willing to accept the fact that this piece of man-made machinery could be defeated by nature. Passengers flatly refused to get on lifeboats. They were not willing to accept that this marvel of technology was anything other than the unsinkable thing that they perceived it to be. So the abandoned ship was, was given at about midnight. 
And by eyewitness reports, at about 20 past two on the 15th of April, the Titanic disappeared from view for the last time. And like I said in answer to that question earlier, one lifeboat drill had been conducted and it was whilst in Southampton dock before leaving for its maiden voyage. That was it. There was no other training. Um, I searched long and hard for this photo. In, in, in Ballard's book, which I'll talk, show you a picture of in a minute, if memory serves me rightly, this photo is on the last page. And this is the last photo ever taken of the Titanic. It was taken by someone on the shore at Queenstown in Ireland, um, where the Titanic had docked before. So it went to Southampton, it went to Cherbourg, then went to Queenstown, and then off to New York on its um, fateful voyage. And this is the last photograph ever taken of it. And I just, it took me a long time to find it, but it's, just, it's been, been in my memory for a long time. Oh, Titanic trivia time, he said. Titanic trivia time. Um, the Titanic was unsinkable. This is a commonly held myth about the Titanic, that it was advertised as unsinkable, that people talked about it as unsinkable. And this is plays to the story that this unsinkable thing was sunk. Man cannot beat nature. But the facts are, it's been retrofitted to the narrative. But at the time, the White Star Line talked about its safety and talked about, I think I've got, um, talked about its safety, but it never really said it was unsinkable. Um, if you can just read, I'll read this out to you, this um, newspaper report at the time. Builder of Titanic says she is safe. Belfast, April the 15th. Interesting, because some of these comments come out when people knew the Titanic had been hit, but the very first news reports on the morning of the 15th were that there were no casualties at all. Um, a representative of Harlander Wolf, the constructor of the Titanic, interviewed today, said if the Titanic was sinking, the collision must have been of great force. The plating of the vessel, he said, was of the heaviest caliber, and even if it were pierced, any two of her compartments should be flooded without Im something imperiling the safety of the ship. Um, <clears throat> yes, it was designed with big safeguards in place. However, look, so Philip Franklin, White Star Line Vice President, there is no danger that Titanic will sink. The boat is unsinkable and nothing but inconvenience will be suffered by the passengers. Oh, I hear people cry. No, hold on. He's definitely saying it's unsinkable. Interestingly, this interview took place on the 15th of April. As he was saying this, the Titanic was already at the bottom of the ocean. He didn't know it at the time. Wow. Matt, just, just, just on that yeah. note, you move on. One of our guests has commented that, um, that some of the lifeboats um, left the ship half empty because um, the passengers, some of the passengers were reluctant to, to enter the lifeboats because they, they actually thought the ship was a safer proposition. Yeah, absolutely right, because some of the first class passengers were very publicly saying this as well. Um, I think I've got that quoted somewhere here and I can't remember <coughs> who said it. It might have been Jacob Astor. Um, yeah, but said exactly that. He said, I'm much safer on this thing than I am on that thing. And if your perception is that this huge piece of engineering is not going to sink and is safe, then the small thing next to it is not the place you want to be. Mm. Um, so this little extract here is from a brochure from 1910 advertising you know, the Titanic and the Olympic and the, the Britannic. Um, as far as it is possible to do so, these two wonderful vessels are designed to be unsinkable. So no one said it was, but they made some pretty interesting allusions. And the fact that they said it and it sank on its maiden voyage sort of perpetuated this myth that everybody thought it was unsinkable. And as the, the, the question that you just said, you know, eyewitness reports that people stayed on it because they fervently believed that this man-made object was not going to be consumed by the sea, obviously didn't have a great grasp of the laws of physics, but also believed in man's superiority to, um, to nature. And uh, I, I don't believe this story, but I like this story, <coughs> that this is, the, this is the iceberg that sank the Titanic. Now, another vessel in the same area around the same time, the SS Prince Aldebar, took this photograph and there is a suggestion that there was paint and metal marks on this particular iceberg, hence the photograph. And the romantic in me wants that to be the case. I, I don't know, but well, my, my thought is, if that was the case, there would be more photographs of it and it would have been 
yeah, if it's a big thing like that, it's going to be trapped for a little bit longer. Anyway, moving not so swiftly on, the, the discovery of the Titanic. As I said earlier, this is the picture. This is the very first discovery of the Titanic. And it, it's this which sort of got me interested in it. <coughs> and it was this book, The Discovery of the Titanic. I had this book, and it is full of the most incredible pictures. And if you see it in a secondhand bookshop, if you see it on eBay, grab it. Even if you have no interest in the Titanic, it's fascinating. It tells the story and the pictures in it, the National Geographic sponsored pictures are incredible. And the paintings by Ken Marshall, like this one here, yeah, are just awe-inspiring, awe-inspiring. So um, it really was the holy grail of oceanographic pursuits to find the Titanic. And there were lots of teams after it. There were the US Navy were after it. The French were desperately trying to find it um, through their Research Institute for Exploration of the Sea, or Yves Air, um, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Boston. They were all looking for it. And Robert Ballard, this guy who wrote that book, was the guy that found it. And he'd been looking at it, looking for it for a couple of years. Quite a few people have been looking at it, looking for it for a couple of years. And his techniques of sweeping the floor, like mowing the lawn, were the ones that eventually managed to find the Titanic. And they found, when they found it, it was miles away from where the Titanic had reported it was when it sank, which is why it wasn't found until 19, the 1980s. <coughs> and the first thing he found was a boiler. And then he found the debris field, and then he found the front, and then he found the back. Um, but interesting bit of Titanic trivia is he wasn't really looking for it at all. It was all a front. He was actually searching for nuclear submarines. Um, he managed to get funding from the US Navy for his expedition to find the Titanic as a front to looking for the USS Scorpion um, which, and the USS Thresher, which were lost at sea. So the technology uh, of this thing, the Argo, and the little submersible it used called Jason, Jason and the Argonauts, um, was all a front to find these nuclear submarines, which they did find. Um, but Jason and Argo, these two things here, got some of the very first pictures of the Titanic. Here's the very first one of the boiler, and this is a boiler with slightly more high resolution. And a year later, Ballard went back in a manned submersible called Alvin, uh, funded by the um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And the Alvin and the Jason and the Argo were the things that documented the Titanic really for the first time. And they made a couple of expeditions there, you know, and there's been hundreds of expeditions since. You know, people started paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to privately go and see the Titanic. Uh, another bit of trivia, uh, no, bathtub related trivia. So I mentioned earlier, there were only three bathtubs for third class passengers. That is the captain's bathtub. <coughs> of all the things they managed to find on the bottom, the five and a half thousand artifacts, which included a menu from the final night's meal, boots, gloves, the bell from the lookout post that signaled the, the iceberg, the violin that played on the deck as the ship went down. They found all of that stuff and Captain Edward Smith's bathtub. Um, so the discovery got Ken Marshall painting all of these pictures. And like I said, that was a big influence on my interest in the Titanic because some of his pictures, which I'll show you a bit of, were incredible. The top there is a Ken Marshall painting from the, uh, from the mid 1980s. And you can just see how closely represented it was in the 1997 movie. It's almost identical. Um, these are some of the pictures that he painted of the Titanic in its state at the moment. Sorry, the one on the right, slightly poor resolution. I've got a better one in a minute. And this is as close as we can get to knowing what it really looks like down there, because obviously it's pitch black. And these are composites of thousands and thousands and thousands of little photographs. And um, this one I find particularly interesting because it's not really what it looks like, but it's a lovely image of the discovery of the Titanic. Okay, so there's the, the scene we've done, the ship, the history, the sinking, and now the movie. And you think Titanic, <coughs> and everyone thinks this iconic image of Jack and Rose on the bow of the Titanic. Um, but quick, quick stop for Titanic trivia time. Titanic trivia time. Um, so you'll see on the screen there, 11 Titanics. James Cameron's 1997 movie grossed $2.2 billion. With $2.2 billion, you could build 11 Titanics. 
that is apropos of nothing. That's just a really interesting piece of trivia. Anyway, back to the movie. Um, the movie that everyone thinks about, the 1997 multi-Oscar winning, longest movie I've ever sat in a cinema and watched. First, first film as an adult that had an intermission in it when I watched it. But for me, this is not the movie of the Titanic that I remember. This is the movie of the Titanic that I remember. This is the one I remember watching at Christmas in 1980, Raise the Titanic, where the intrepid gentleman on the left, Richard Jordan, gets financed to go to the bottom of the ocean and raise the Titanic. It's given kudos by the fact that Obi-Wan Kenobi is also in it with Alec Guinness. Um, this is widely regarded as an absolutely terrible movie, um, but I remember at the time, it was fascinating to watch them raise the Titanic. And I always felt as a quite a smug little 12 year old that I'd read the book and I knew you couldn't do it because it was in two pieces. But in Raise the Titanic, they raise it. There it is coming out of the water. There it is being towed back to New York. You know, those, those of us that knew what really happened knew how absolutely hilariously ridiculous this was. But um, Raise the Titanic 1980, not the first movie to have made about the Titanic. You know, by the time this came out in 1958, you know, in that second wave of Titanic mania, um, this is a, a sort of film version of the book, Walter Lord's 1995 book, A Night to Remember, which is like a minute by minute reportage of the last night of the, uh, of the Titanic. So this one had come out already. This is widely regarded as a very, very good movie, although the special effects, as you can see, not quite up to Cameron standards. But for me, even this wasn't the movie where I really, I remember seeing the Titanic. This one was. Now that's for the movie buffs out there. Ghostbusters 2 from 1989 also has the Titanic into it, in it. And for those smug little 13 year olds like me, when you see a picture of the Titanic like this, I'm going, no, no, no. It couldn't have got back even with ghosts on because it's in two pieces at the bottom of the ocean. Anyway, the movie Titanic. Um, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but what I loved about it is it paid some real, real attention to the scenery. It paid some real attention to the work Ballard had done, the paintings Marshall had done, you know, the artifacts that people knew about. They're all in this, and they're in this in such incredible detail. Yeah, it took, cost $200 million to make. It took $2.2 billion. To this day, it is the third highest grossing movie of all time behind Avatar and Avengers Endgame. But things like this, you know, on the left, an actual photograph of the Grand Staircase. On the right, you know, the version from the movie, the mock-up from the movie. It's incredible. This one I particularly like because this is real attention to detail. Picture on the right, the gym on the Titanic being used by first-class passengers on its maiden voyage. On the right, Jack and Rose stealing a few minutes together on their voyage. But if you look in the background, it's laid out exactly the same way, which I think is incredible. Even the casting in the movie and some of the key actors, uh, so, sorry, actors in the um, character sense, as well as people involved in the real story of the movie. They just look really, really similar. Thomas Andrews on the right, who built the Titanic, is played by the actor on the left, Victor Garber, and they look really, really similar. It's an amazing piece of casting. Um, William Murdoch on the right, who is in the build, film portrayed as an absolute villain who fires shots on deck and then commits suicide, um, is played by, um, you and Stuart on the on the left of my screen there. Total misrepresentation. Murdoch was a hero. He helped dozens of people onto um, onto lifeboats, and his family actually sought an apology from James Cameron afterwards. Um, the Strausses, you know, owners of Macy's department store on the left, you know, played by almost identical um, sorry actors on the left, real people on the right, um, played by almost identical um, looking people. It's incredible. Now, no one knows if they did take to their bed, you know, and await their fate. But what is clear is. Um, Isidore Strauss uh, and his wife Ida refused, absolutely point blank, refused to get on the um, on the lifeboat. So I found, you know, all of those really, really interesting um, attentions to detail, and I did a bit of research on that, and then I found this: um, a family that absolutely aren't represented anywhere. You, know, you can look a long way to find this family's representation in the Titanic story. The um, Joseph Philip Le Mercier La Roche. Sorry, I just had to read that the only black passenger or crew member out of two and a half thousand on the Titanic. And he died as well. Um, but the movie, of course, had some really seminal moments. And I've just picked that one with Jack and Rose on the left. And I, I really like that because 
The picture on the right is also really, really emotive because there's the film set and the story, and there's it in real time on the bottom of the ocean. And it's almost, you can sort of, I look at that, I can sort of picture them on top of it. So we've done a bit of the ship, we've done a bit of the history, we've done a bit of the sinking, we've done a bit of the movie. Now a little bit about the stories, the, the sort of myths about it. I, I started calling this myths and legends, but I don't know enough about myths and legends. I'm not Mr. Ryan East or Dr. Bradbury, so I just called it the story. Um, first one, you know, the band. You know, it, the commonly held um, belief is that the band played on. The band stayed on deck, serenading passengers until the absolute end. And that is, entire, from what I can understand, entirely accurate. There are plenty and plenty of eyewitnesses that say that these guys played to the bitter end. Um, there were historians on that documented the entire night and said that there is some conjecture as to what they were playing. Um, Nearer my gods to thee is the mythical answer that they were playing this. I think that's probably inaccurate and has been retrofitted. And they were probably playing some real cheery stuff to keep spirits high. But they did. The band played on. And the phrase, the band played on, that we were tribute to the heroic musicians of the Titanic, who were paid very poorly. They weren't implied by the White Star Line. They were just hired for this journey. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a nice, true one. Um, Captain Smith going down with his ship. Now, there are very conflicting reports about Captain Smith on the evening of the 14th. There are eyewitness reports that Captain Smith stepped up. He was all over the place. He made visits below decks. He was a very big presence. He got people onto lifeboats. He was a hero in the way he conducted himself. However, there are conflicting reports in that Captain Smith faced with this tragedy suffered basically a mental breakdown and went into a catatonic state and just retreated into his wheelhouse to await his fate, as the movie tells us there. So the captain did go down with his ship and that he perished in the disaster, but did he go down with stoicism and heroism? Well, we're not quite sure. Um, he would have made 200 pounds as a bonus if the Titanic had got to New York without incident. He'd had 40 years as a career without any incident whatsoever. Well, boys, do your best for the women and children and look out for yourselves, are his last words, apparently. But we also have reports that his last words were, be British, boys, be British. Anyway, so these myths, these legends, these stories sort of roll on through history. And one that I love, and it's not my own, but it's, a, um, it's from The Onion, a satirical newspaper, and they, they do a history series where they, have, they print up these satirical historical newspaper um, front pages. And I love this. I, I just think this is, I find this absolutely hilarious. And it, this, this is the thing that made me want to investigate the Titanic a little bit more for tonight. And I really wanted to see if I could hang something on this joke. And I couldn't do it, but I like the tone of it. But the world's largest metaphor hits an iceberg. You know, this idea that the Titanic summed up man's hubris and man's ability to best everything on the planet that's just smashed by an iceberg. Anyway, um, so I like that. Um, and I, I just like the way that certain things have resonated. So, so on the left there, that's one of the final scenes from, um, from the movie. That's the water plowing through the wheelhouse. And there is the... You know, the any maritime people are going to hate me for this. It's the steering wheel from the Titanic. I'm sure it's not called that at all. Uh, it, the movie got it in such meticulous detail. And this shone to me because the picture on the right is the actual wheelhouse from the Titanic um, before, it left dry, before it left dock in Southampton. And that picture there, I'll just go back one. If you look behind that wheel, there's a mechanism. It's called the telemotor. And that's it on the bottom of the ocean hundred years later and it's virtually untouched and I think that's incredible that the bridge isn't there the windows aren't there the doors aren't there the wheels not there but that bit's there and it's positively gleaming and it just it just sits there as this little beacon of um like resilience you know it's the last bit of man's hubris from that onion um newspaper report you know there on the bottom of the ocean fighting off anything that's going to um, get in its way. 
I'm going to zoom through this. There have been a number of books written about this, which really propagate these ideas and stories. This one comes from 1955, Walter Lord, A Night to Remember. Um, and it really was, as I've said a few times, this sort of diarized minute by minute report, pretty factually, factually accurate from what we think. But it's also been put into fiction, Beryl Bainbridge, uh, Every Man for Himself, which was a fictional account of someone on there, but obviously drawn from, um, from real experiences. And it references quite a few of the real characters on there, like Molly Brown. Um, and then this one I thought was quite interesting. Um, Titanic, the Canadian story, where this um, Canadian author called Alan Hustak just gives a, 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 an interesting sort of demographic slant on a group who you know, weren't British, weren't American, but they're their experiences. Um, but it's not going away. This, this idea, the myth of the Titanic, the idea of it just doesn't go away. And people are trying to replicate it. I think it's really interesting. So on the left-hand side is a computer rendering of Titanic 2. So Clive Palmer, an Australian businessman, is looking to build this. And it's, it's stuttered and started a few times. He's put $500 million into it for a slightly bigger seagoing replica of the Titanic. Um, on the right-hand side is another replica that's been built in China in, um, in landlocked um, province called, I can't remember what it's called, um, Sichuan province in a landlocked area. So it's going to be a replica of the Titanic, not seaworthy, but an exact replica as part of a tourist attraction. I think the fact that people are looking to invest half a billion dollars in replicating something that sank on day one just says something quite interesting about um, you know, the story, the narrative that carries on about this thing. Um, James Cameron, that made the movie, he, uh, in, in a really, relatively pompous way, summed up what he thought about the Titanic sort of story. And I'll read it now. He said, Titanic is a metaphor. It's about the hubris of the ship owners. It's about society. It was a very optimistic time. Technology was advancing. Everything looked like there would be a great future. The Titanic stood for that. But then suddenly the unthinkable happened and all of it went down with the Titanic. There was the first class, second class, third class and the crew. You had the rich, the mighty, the middle class, the lower class and the government. And the government was influenced by the wealthy and they were driving this ship too fast, deliberately playing with the lives and the future of the other people. And when they saw the iceberg, it was too late. So I think it's quite interesting. And this is from Walter Lord. He wrote the book. We imagine that the Titanic represented a golden age that was symbolically lost when the ship went down. Yeah, and it gets tied up with this lost generation of the First World War. It's possible because it's a story of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. And we've seen this resonated through history with other disasters. Cowardice, bravery, incompetence, dutifulness, self-sacrifice, selfishness, and heroism. I also think that because is only just over the horizon of human memory. It is very easy to imagine oneself on that ship on that night and wonder how we might behave ourselves. And I want to leave you with this, which I think is maybe the saddest one, that in my lifetime, the Titanic will disappear. It is disappearing day by day. It's being eaten by a specific bacteria down there. And experts reckon that by 2030, it will have disappeared. And I think that's really sad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. That, that was absolutely fascinating. What an unbelievably in, incredible level of detail. So um, thank you for, so much for that. Um, Matt, we've got a few questions which um, I'd like to um, just go through with you, if that's OK. For, um, we'll for see our, whether I can answer any of them. Out there. I think I might have highlighted my lack of knowledge as we went along. So I'm just going just gonna to start by um, actually we had a question um, asking about the difference between the Britannic and, and the, the Titanic. And um, Mr. Vigar has jumped in. Um, oh, thank you. An engineer and a physicist. So I'm just going to just uh, read out what Mr. Vigar said, which is very helpful. Is the Britannic was a near sister ship. The principal dimensions were the same, but the fit out was different in light of lessons learnt through the sinking of the Titanic. For example, better lifeboat launching mechanisms and more lifeboats. Fundamental design faults, however, still remained, such as inadequate compartmentalization of the bulkheads. Very good, Josh. And the use of low grade rivets in the plating. So thanks very much for that, Giles. And hopefully um, that um, answers one of, the, one of the questions we had. Um, 
Matt, a couple of other questions we've got that I'd like to put to you. Um, so firstly, um, how long did it take for the news to reach the White Star execs on the shore? Um, because of the relatively new telegraph mechanism, the Marconi telegraph, um, they would have known pretty much instantaneously about it being hit, but not about the severity of it because it took so long to sink. And there's there's loads out there about um, other boats in the area whether they could have come and rescued the you know the Californian, the Carpathian, um, and there's reams written about that. But in terms of scale, my understanding is they didn't know you know for most of the following day. Mm. But interest, just to go back, um, what Giles was talking about, the rivets, um, there's lots out there about the manufacturing process of the Titanic and whether it had flaws and the riveting grades and whether they were brittle under the temperature of the water and whether they should have held. Um, but what, what I read is that it, the sister ships, the Olympic and the Britannic, were pretty roughly tufty and had been through a lot and had a few whacks themselves and survived them. Because mm. uh, I think the... the Titanic and the Olympic were built at the same time and the Britannic followed. And so the Britannic probably did redress a lot of those. But I think the Olympic had a long service. Okay, thank you. And um, Matt, just, um, just, just one of our questions. Uh, how long after the Titanic sunk was it discovered? So we talked so about- it sank on April the 15th, 1912 and it was discovered September, 1985. So okay. 70 years. Yeah, and then and then once it was discovered, yeah, how long before any real action happened to get robots down there? Or a year, it was a year. So they first discovered it with remote operated vehicles in 1985, September 1985, and then were going down in the Alvin in people a year later. Okay. So in that year. Yeah. Okay. So people Thanks. have been look, people have been actively looking for it for a few years before that. And I just stumbled through the bit where what Ballard did is um, it was mowing, like mowing a lawn. He went backwards and forwards. And, and just on, you know, they got within, people before got within a couple of hundred metres of it. They found out in retrospect and missed it because it wasn't where they thought it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one, of, one of the issues is, you know, they shouldn't have been where they were near the ice. They should have moved. And they misreported where they were when they sank. And you talk, you know, you, you, you're talking about vast areas of ocean floor in um, vast, in, in, in vast ocean. areas, so, a yeah. very deep ocean floor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt, another question which has um, come in from um, the floor is: um, if there were many ships near the location of the Titanic when it was sinking, um, how can it be that there wasn't that, that, that there weren't rescue ships arriving? It's a good point, and I'm trying to wrap my memory as to, it is a matter of some big conjecture as to why they didn't go to its aid. And there is, so from memory, the Californian and the Carpathian were close, like almost visually close. And I know, and Giles is probably sitting there goes, well, you can see X number of nautical miles, and I don't know what that is, but they were quite a long way away, but I think there was some visual. And people on the Titanic have reported seeing other boats. And there's apparently a third boat, this mystery boat that people reported seeing that nobody knows where it was. But no, by all accounts, they could have come, should have come, and might have rescued more people. Okay. Um, just, just, just to thank you. Just the point that, that Mr. Vargas jumped in with says that the, um, the Olympic was broken up in 1935-ish and the Britannic was sunk by a German mine in the Aegean in World War I. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are more uh, questions out there, if you'd like to pop them in the Q&A box, we've got one which I think um, I've held back because I think it'd be a, a great one to finish on. Um, Matt, if you were able to, uh, but if there are any more out there, obviously uh, chuck them in, but um, I'll just go with this one anyway at this stage. If you were able to, to time travel to the Titanic. Oh my word. <laughs> this, is, this is a good one. This is a really good one. What would be the first thing you'd want to go and see or to find out? That was a great question. Thank you, whoever uh, put that on. That's fantastic. Well, there is the, um, the correct response, which I imagine is, I would like to go to the Marconi room 
and reminds them of their obligations to tell the people in the um, lookout tower and the captain of the six messages they received on the 14th of April telling them of icebergs. But the real answer is I'd probably like to go to the first class dining room because they had a 10 course dinner on the last night. And I just, I'd love to know the experience of first class dining on the Titanic. It has something of, you know, a first class dining experience on the Titanic. Mm. This sounds incredible. Pretty special. It's quite Douglas Adamsy. Of that thought, actually, time traveling. Yeah, that that that, that yeah, an, an awesome question and very very difficult to answer, I think. Um, okay, so um, we've just had another question come in, Matt, um, which is um, yeah, another really good question. Do you think we will ever stop caring about the Titanic? It's a really interesting one. Um, a couple of the quotes that I had up on screen, you know, talked about this not being, um, being still being within living memory when the person was, was making the quote and it, and it just isn't anymore. But I, no, I think part of the, 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 the story about it is this bit that the onion reference, that it is this remarkable metaphor for, for the human being not being able to tame nature and the human beings thinking they're above nature and above the natural world and falling flat on their faces and i can't think of a better metaphor than the titanic and it's so taught you know it was the age of empire it was the class the levels of class within it and the stories that have emanated from that that are you, know, you can find little bits of them applicable in lots of different bits um but on the flip side <clears throat> It's very expensive to go down and look at it. It's not going to be there forever. Mm. And technology and life will move on at a pace. And, you know, it's not the biggest thing that was ever made by a long stretch now. It's not the biggest disaster and loss of life. There are bigger, there are worse. So there's a romance about it that I think carries it. I mean, if I'm thinking of a comparable loss of life disaster, the Twin Towers disaster, which is, you know, 2,000 people, and a horrible brutality about it, you know, really, really violent. And that will resonate because of that. This you know, is a horrible loss of life, but it has a romance, I think. And I'm not saying that because I think I'm influenced by the movie. There's a romance about the, the, the Edwardian age of the first-class passenger. And, and going to America by boat and it taking a week and that being okay. You know, and this boat went half full. You know, it had lots of space on it because it's people, and people paying $80,000 for a ticket. Mm. Anyway. Matt, just um, one, one, um, one, one comment that's come in from the floor, which um, just going back to the reason why there weren't any, I'm talking about the, the ships nearby and the potential of rescue. Um, and um, one of our guests has, has commented that the, the Californian had stopped for the night and, um, and was unfairly scapegoated. Um, the Titanic had told them to go away and stop interrupting their messages. That, okay, <clears throat> I'm glad they've said that because I had, I had that in my head a little bit. I wasn't sure about that when you asked the question. I, that, mm. And apparently the, um, the, the, the Mount Temple's master has a lot more questions to answer. There are good books out there. So there actually is a genuine Titanic expert out there who's putting me to shame. Yeah. Uh, not at all. Not at all. So, um, Matt, um, I think you know we, you, you've you've given us an incredible talk, um, which you know with with unbelievable level of detail. So, um, thank you so much um, for that. Um, I'm going to just uh, allow you to to have some evening. So, um, so we're going to we're going to um, say thank you very much. And um, I'd like to obviously thank you. Um, that was that's fascinating, and um, I really appreciate the enormous amount of time that's you know that's clearly um, gone into your your talk this evening. So thank you very very much. And um, also I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. And um, and you know and, and thank you for not only for tonight, um, but I'd like to um, thank everyone for supporting this series of um, MA Experience, our Max Talks. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing them. I hope you've enjoyed um, listening to them. And, um, and yeah, it's just been a really, really um, enjoyable experience. And 
very, very brilliantly capped off by tonight. So thank you very much, Matt. And um, yeah, thank you to everyone who's been involved. Thanks for asking. It was um, a really rewarding and fascinating thing to look back into. Okay, thank you. And thanks very much to everyone for joining us. Thanks very much. Good night.